Thanks very much. I'd just like to say, but start with that um, both um, Guy and Stephen's talks were really fascinating. I found them very moving. And uh, I think that's exactly the kind of journalism which we should be looking for in the coverage of this conflict. And it shows what can be done and what should be done uh, by the media. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly about the politics uh, of the conflict from both the British perspective but also um, the regional perspective. Because it's now almost eight years since uh, the US and Brit Britain launched the war on terror with the attack on Afghanistan, the so-called Operation Enduring Freedom. And we were told at that time, if you remember, that the conflict would be all over by Christmas, or in fact it was all over by Christmas. Women were throwing off their burkas, flight kites were flying, um, journalists who'd thrown, cast doubt on the whole operation and the invasion were ridiculed and taken to task by the government. Downing Street published a special uh, hall of shame, a name and shame of the bad journalists who had dared to suggest that the, uh, that the invasion of Afghanistan was going to lead to a long-term and bloody foreign occupation. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say I was one of those named and shamed. Uh, and eight years later... Uh, it, Eight years later, of course, uh, we're still there, and it is indeed uh, a long and bloody occupation. Now, if you remember, it was launched in response to the 9-11 attacks. Uh, contrary to what is often said, there was no direct UN authorization of the invasion of Afghanistan. In fact, if you look at the resolutions, they don't even mention the word Afghanistan. They only talk about self-defense, which, of, of course, is part of the... UN Charter anyway. Uh, and of course the training for the 9-11 for the attacks was of course mostly done in Germany and the US, um, according to the Americans' own account. But this attack plunged, as some of the others have already mentioned, into what was a pre-existing Afghan civil war, itself the product of an earlier Western intervention. Now what were the original aims of the invasion? stated at the time by President Bush. One, the capture alive or dead of Osama bin Laden. Two, the capture alive or dead of Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. Three, the destruction of Al-Qaeda. Now, eight years later, not a single one of those aims has been achieved. Uh, Mullah Omar is still at large, Osama bin Laden is still at large, and Al-Qaeda is very far from having been destroyed at all. Nor have the others, uh, other aims that have been come up, come up with in an ever-changing kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope of war aims, whether it's you know, the promotion of democracy, the eradication of opium, preventing terror attacks. Instead, the US and NATO have brought back the warlords who dominated Afghanistan before the Taliban came to power. They've been installed in phony elections and, dr and driven the Taliban and Al-Qaeda over the border into Pakistan. So what's the result? The result is escalating guerrilla war, thousands of Afghan civilians killed, as we've seen so tragically, rampant co corruption, an increase in violence against women. And Afghanistan, of course, now is the heroine capital of the world under NATO occupation. And of course, as we've seen in the last week, we've got now the highest level of attacks on NATO forces, the 15 British soldiers killed in nine days, which has led to this sort of panic in the political and media establishment and the barrage of media war propaganda that we've been subjected to in recent days. Now, of course, the war on terror spread from Afghanistan into the cat catastrophic aggression against Iraq uh, and the interventions in Somalia, Lebanon, Palestine, Pakistan, the orgy of torture, kidnapping and imprisonment without trial that we've seen over the past uh, eight years. And everywhere that war on terror is now in ruins and seen to be discredited, not as a war on terror, but a war of terror to enforce Western domination and control of resources in the Middle East and beyond.
But even as Iraq is now almost universally accepted and seen as having been a disaster and a defeat for the West, Afghanistan is still promoted, as we've been discussing already, by Western politicians and the media as the good war. Now, Des Brown, he was one of the defence secretaries here in Britain, the one before, the one before last, I think it was. Des Brown, he called it the noble cause of the 21st century, the Afghan war. President Sarkozy recently called the Afghan war, Afghan war a fight for freedom and democracy. And yesterday, Gordon Brown said that the continuation of this war and this occupation is our patriotic duty. Now, President Obama, who is himself a product of the failure of the war on terror and the disaster of Iraq, called it the central front in the war on terror. And while he signalled eventual withdrawal from Iraq, Obama, of course, is escalating the war in Afghanistan with the current surge of 20, 21,000 more troops, a 50% increase on the pre-existing level of forces. But at least you can say for Obama, it is what he promised. He said in his election campaign that that's what he was going to do. Unlike, of course, the British government, which when it began what effectively was a second occupation in 2006 of Helmand province, as Stephen was talking about. It's hard to forget John Reid, another Defence Secretary in a long line, who promised or hoped at the time that the British troops would leave Helmand province without firing a shot. At least four million rounds later, the troops are now being increased from eight to 10,000, the British troops that is. But even at the, the level they're aiming for, the NATO forces of 90,000 occupation troops, nobody believes, no military expert believes that they can possibly succeed in pacifying the country or defeating the resistance and the Taliban. And what it means for Afghanistan is not only growing resistance which goes well beyond the traditional Taliban and has effectively become partly a Pashtun nationalist movement, something I think uh, Stephen was referring to, but we've got an increase of civilian deaths at the rate of doubling every two years, officially more than 2,000 last year, but as we've seen from the account that Guy has given, it's undoubtedly far, far, far higher than that, given the reckoning and the counting that is made by the occupation forces. I mean, before 2006, there were 150 foreign troops in Helmand province. There are now well over 15,000, getting up for 20,000. And the violence, far from being reduced, has escalated massively, and the killing and insecurity has swamped the province. And that's the impact of the increase in the occupation. This is the war of civilization hailed by the British media, where US air attacks are called in to protect US and British soldiers' lives at the expense of sacrificing hundreds or thousands of Afghan civilians, uh, sometimes hundreds at a time, as Guy has talked about in Bala Balu. So no wonder there's an increase in resistance across the country. No wonder that the opposition to foreign troops has been growing steadily, and even in the occupation countries, states own Opinion polls held of Afghans, even that is showing through where you've now got clear majorities for a withdrawal of foreign troops within one to two years. And that's even given the fact that they're being held by, by organizations which are linked by Afghans with the military occupation. Not that you'd hear that much about these things in most of the British media, which has basically largely allowed itself to be turned into an instrument of state war propaganda over Afghanistan. Firstly, I would say by relying almost entirely on embedded reporting, and Stephen's talked about the problems of that and the possibilities of it, uh, and failing in any way seriously to attempt to report from the other side of the conflict. And taking Stephen's points on board, I think it is clearly possible to do that. Uh, the Guardian, for example, has a reporter currently in Af Afghanistan who's not embedded. It is possible to get outside of the embeds, and it's increasingly necessary if we're going to have serious reporting of the conflict. And secondly, the media has 
failed in its basic task by signing up to an increasingly crude government attempt to exploit sympathy for British troops to corral public support for what is a deeply unpopular war. That's what the military parades and the Armed Forces Day, Day is all about. And the media has lapped it up at every stage of the game uncritically, reaching what I would say, what I would regard as a crescendo in the last few days, when the huge gap in the value attached to Western and Afghan lives could not have been made clearer. So what's surprising is not that opposition to the war may have dropped back a bit, as the headline in The Guardian said today, um, and you can imagine there's been some inter interesting discussions about that headline at our office, uh, but that the opposition to the war remains a majority despite the propaganda barrage, dis despite the attempt to corral people's support behind sympathy with British troops, and that as Lindsay German said earlier, 56% of the population in that poll were found to be wanting all British troops out by the end of the year, 60% by 2011. Uh, which only goes to show, really, that the British public has a good deal more sense uh, than the political and media elite trying to dragoon them into backing a doomed and immoral enterprise. Now, I happen to hear, uh, before I left work tonight to come here, uh, that there's another poll going to be broadcast by ITN tonight, which shows 59% of people in this country want troops out of Afghanistan uh, immediately. And it is a doomed enterprise because, most dangerously of all, the Afghan war has now spread into nuclear-armed Pakistan. Far from uprooting terrorism in Afghanistan, the war has merely spread it across the border boosting the Pashtun resistance in Pakistan itself, Talibanizing Pakistan's northwest, sucking in US troops and drone attacks. And now the pressure on the Pakistani state to act against what's been created by the Afghan war has led to the most horrific slaughter and two million refugees inside uh, Pakistan in the war against the Pakistani Taliban. And the risk now as it is of what they call the Afpak conflict engulfing the region as a whole. I mean, if the, if the Afghan war continues the escalation that Obama is now engaged on, it's not just that, uh, that Afghanistan risks becoming Obama's Vietnam, but Pakistan risks becoming his Cambodia. This is the war, they say, that is the war for democracy, when parties can't even stand in elections for the second most corrupt government in the world where even the modest gains in women's rights that have been achieved are now being reversed, and where a supposed war on terror is in fact spreading terror. Now, Gordon Brown and David Miliband and the new Defence Secretary, Bob Ainsworth, <laughs> all now insist that the war in Afghanistan is about preventing terrorism on the streets of Britain. I would say that all the evidence shows that the exact opposite is the case. There were no terrorist attacks by jihadist groups before 9-11, before Britain went into Afghanistan and Iraq. And not only is Afghanistan and Iraq cited by British intelligence as being a crucial factor in driving that terror threat, but those people attempting to do those attacks in Britain cite it themselves. I mean, it's not only that this war is fueling the terror threat, it's heightening community tensions in the country and Islamophobia as the media hypes up its tales of imperial daring do in faraway lands. Well, they're faraway lands to some people, but to some communities in this country, they're very, very close at hand and very close to their communities and their background. And that is a mortal threat which they are increasing all the time with this war. Now, the current political storm about equipment and helicopters is transparently a red herring. British soldiers are dying in Afghanistan because they are occupiers in another Muslim country where they're not wanted. 
The only and obvious solution to this conflict, and this is what will happen in the end, is a withdrawal that is negotiated with all significant forces on the ground in Afghanistan, including the Taliban and the regional powers in the area that have shown their ability to interfere and engage in Afghan affairs. That includes Pakistan, Iran, Russia, India. But NATO leaders instead are talking of staying for decades, and the head of the British Army, General Dannett, the other day talked about the Iraqi and Afghan wars as being signposts to the future. I think that's a pretty ominous kind of uh, comment, because these kind of long-term occupations and the spread of this unwinnable war is a danger to us all. Britain's best contribution right now would be to follow the example of Canada and the Netherlands and announce its intention to withdraw from Afghanistan now. It's only Afghans and their neighbours that can resolve this conflict that's what public opinion, both here and in Afghanistan, has long wanted. Our job is to turn that view into effective pressure to bring the troops home. Thanks very much. Yeah, just to, I mean, there were quite a few questions about this negotiated withdrawal point, political machinery for that, whether the countries in the area would, um, would cooperate with that. I mean, as I said, I, th I think that's clearly what will eventually happen, uh, because it will be in the interests of both the neighbouring countries and the United States and the Western powers and, of course, the Afghans for that to happen. And, and the tragedy is that it's just the amount of time that will pass before that happens and the amount of blood that will be shed. I mean... I think that there's a huge credibility problem that the US has uh, for, from in, in any projected withdrawal, which has already lost huge uh, strategic credibility over Iraq, and uh, it's going to lose more over Afghanistan, so it doesn't want to. I think it, it's very interesting that Barack Obama, uh, in March, he raised for the first time the, the fact is the, the point that there has to be an exit strategy, which seemed to me quite a significant. Um, indicator, even though he then is going on to escalate the war, at least in the short term. I mean, I think they're preparing for that, and obviously the struggle will be over who benefits and who loses in that process, but it will happen, and clearly all the significant forces in the country have to be involved in a, in a settlement that's going to last. I mean, it seems to me, and I, I, I don't know what, um, what uh, the others feel about that, but it seems to me that the Taliban, which is effectively a Pashtun movement, um, is, you know, can never again, or not that it was ever in control of the whole of Afghanistan, but it cannot dominate the country in that way. In any way, the resistance in the country is clearly spread out from the Taliban, become more diffuse and more complex. Um, but it's, oh, at the same time, it's, it's clearly also um, a player. Uh, the political machinery, um, I think it could be the UN, it could be uh, all sorts of uh, bodies, but that's not really the most important thing. It's the fact that the states involved need to take the political decision to do that, which, they, as I say, I think they will do. It's a question of time. Uh, somebody asked whether this was really about uh, revenge for 9-11. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's become something different from what it started out as, and um, I think it was Rory Stewart, who was a colonial administrator in Iraq in the first years of the occupation and is now had a bit of a Damascene conversion. I don't know whether any of you have heard, heard of him or heard him in the last few days, but he said, uh, you know, the reason, because, the, the reason that the uh, Western powers and NATO and America are staying in Afghanistan is because they're there. And uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's hard for them to find that exit strategy. I think it's, I mean, there are also important strategic uh, positions in the region. I mean, Afghanistan borders on China, uh, Iran, uh, and the Central Asia and, it's, uh, and Pakistan, of course, and it is crucial um, strategically and politically, but I, I think from the Western point of view, some of those things can be uh, sorted out. Uh, John Rees uh, mentioned this point about the military uh, being embedded in journalism, and that's certainly the case. I mean, it has been an absolutely extraordinary uh, um, set of circumstances the last few days. I mean, on Sky TV, for example, the other day, I think it was on Friday, on the, on the day these casualties were announced, 
the uh, TV presenters were dressed in black ties, and when the general came on to be interviewed, they addressed him as Sir. I mean, it, it is quite spooky, and, uh, and I think uh, you know, we have to be very vocal against that kind of uh, behaviour. Um, somebody raised the question of the war and whether it's meant to be won. Uh, Nadim, it was. I mean, I think that it's true that in the kind of neocon picture of the war on terror, that was how it was. It was to be the war without end that was never, never needed to be won, just continued for all time. Uh, I mean, that's clearly failed. Um, and as I said earlier, I think the United States and the West has suffered a strategic defeat over what took place in Iraq, uh, and also is that is taking place in Afghanistan. And Although a lot of blood has been spilt in that process, there are some positive outcomes from that defeat because we need a more balanced and multipolar, um, multipolar world. Um, now, somebody, the last point is it was point was raised about um, women in Afghanistan. Now, I d in the first week of the attack in two October two thousand and one, there was a very interesting uh, interviews that were done by Cherie Blair and Laura Bush to remind people that this was a war for women's emancipation. And uh, there was a, an interesting interview I heard with uh, Laura Bush where she said, you might not know this, but 15 years ago, uh, there were, it's not, Afghanistan hasn't always been like this, 15 years ago, uh, half the civil servants in the country uh, were women and 40% of the teachers were women. And what she neglected to mention was that that was under a government which the United States and the West more generally had spent billions of dollars and sacrificed many, many hundreds of thousands of lives in an attempt to overthrow. Um, now, the, you know, there's a whole other, other issues around that subject, but I think it's, what it points to is the fact that you know, there are different traditions in Afghanistan uh, about women and about the position of women and about all manner of other issues. The picture that is presented of it in the Western media, I think, is very one-sided and distorted. So I, I think uh, you know, the, the, the truth is Afghans can sort out their problems. If you, if you look at the same opinion polls I was mentioning earlier about wanting foreign troops out, you know, Afghans overwhelmingly want girls to have education. Uh, and I've, I've no doubt that those are real responses. So uh, I think, you know, if Afghans are allowed to run their own affairs, the, they will start to sort out these questions and the most, and the most obscurantist elements of Taliban ideology will be overcome. Thank you.